I think it's had a couple different names. Uh, now the High Speed Rail Alliance, and they do a lot of big picture thinking about where could passenger rail go in our country, how do networks work, and uh, what is important for us to look at as we advocate for those things. So when we hear from people um, like Lisa and, and Arun, they're doing great work, uh, but their jobs are not to actually advocate. Uh, but one of the things that organizations like the West Central Wisconsin Rail Coalition and High Speed Rail Alliance is to get out there, educate the public. So I think Rick has some really interesting things he's going to share with us. So would you also welcome Rick Harnish? Rick. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Roger, for getting me out of the house. It's harder, you know, it's it's hard to just stay home and watch Zoom. So I appreciate the opportunity to get out and, and see the world. And uh, it's interesting how much the world has changed in three years, a lot more highway development in Wisconsin, a lot of beautiful new highways. Um, and I think it's time to start getting trains. Scott said, I'm uh, Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Most recently, we were the Midwest High Speed Rail Association, uh, but we found ourselves talking about California a lot, and you'll understand why in a couple of minutes. Um, prior to that, we were the Midwest High Speed Rail Coalition, um, and then before that, the Illinois High Speed Rail Association. So we started with this idea if Spain, could have high-speed trains in 1993 that went from Chicago, I'm sorry, Madrid to Seville, the distance of Chicago to St. Louis, in two and a half hours, two hours and 20 minutes, actually, um, in 1993, we should be able to do that in Illinois. Now, that's a slow train today. Uh, so if you were to build it today, it would probably be uh, much closer to two hours, maybe even 90 minutes, depending upon how aggressive you would want to be. Um, but um, we've got a lot more progress to get towards there, but I think we've made a huge step with the IIJA. Um, and the, now the process is to keep that moving, get people really excited about taking advantage of this opportunity and think bigger. Um, the reason I'm in this is because I like when I can walk to go get a gallon of milk, I like to be able to take a bus to go see my friends. I don't want to have to get in a car the whole time. And when you are doing these things, when you're walking, when you're taking a bus or a train, you see more people, you have more deeper relationships. This, the community itself is much stronger if people are interacting as they're traveling and not stuck in their little cocoons. Um, if we can switch a lot of car trips to bus and train trips, uh, we will do a lot towards uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Um, and third, I, the one that really gets me going is um, I think there's a strong, very strong case to make. And in fact, there's a, uh, an organization called Strong Towns uh, there's a very strong case to make that our current development pattern is actually bankrupting our cities. Um, and if we don't figure out how to get people on transit, our cities themselves are going to be in much worse shape than they are today um, in about a decade or so. So to me, this is incredibly urgent. Um, in my view, we've got to figure out how to be talking about four or five trains at a, at a, a swatch and do it every couple of years as opposed to one train every 10 years. And, and we've got some work to do there politically to get there, but we can get there. This is the first class section of Brightline in Florida. And I want to point out that Brightline launched with hourly service. They didn't launch with one train and then see how it worked and then launch another one, right? They launched with hourly service. Um, even in California on the Capitol Corridor, where they now have 16 trains a day, they did do it step by step, but they started with the plan to get to 16 trains a day because frequency is the most critical part in whether people will choose to ride the train or drive. So you've got to know how you're going to get that frequent service. And on high density corridors, that's probably an hour, uh, train every hour, uh, less dense corridors every two hours, close into the city every 15 minutes minimum. It depends upon where you are, but we've got to be thinking about highly frequent service. So then, and I just, I stumbled upon this. I kept thinking about the interstate highway network as the federally subsidized highway network, right? So I started looking for the map and it turns out this is the federally subsidized highway network. It's huge um, and it's big. So what we decided as part of, as, as a country in 19, as part of the IIJA was 
we wanted to keep this going. So we put $90 billion of direct subsidy into the highway trust fund in order to support this. So I think it's okay for us to be thinking big. We don't need to think little small steps here and there. It's gonna take small steps to get there, but we need to start thinking about how we're gonna connect entire regions, not just city fairs. And part of the reason this is important is um, we talk about city pairs. And so uh, rail advocates for many years have said, we've got to figure out how to get that sweet spot, 100 to 400 mile trip city pairs, right? But the problem is if you just look at one city pair, Chicago to Indianapolis, and this would be a great place to test high-speed rail in this, in this country, um, you've only got a few opportunities to take the train. Now, if you could add stops in the middle, that adds more opportunities to take the train, but it makes the diagram more complex. Um, all of these routes have been in, evaluated independently. None of them quite work on their own, but looks what happens if you start connecting them together. All of a sudden, there's a lot more opportunity to take each of those segments. So what if you took this big long-term picture view and worked backwards, but you said out in the future, this is what we're going to do. Now, all of a sudden, you can justify building a new railroad from Chicago to Indianapolis. And because that new railroad with hourly service and a 90 minute trip time is bringing so much more volume into the system, and because you've taken the trip time out of other things, the other connections become much more viable as well. So, and then it builds upon each other. And every time you add something into the network, more people can use it, which makes each segment more viable. So you really have to think about a network plan if you're gonna get to the long-term plan. That's one of the steps we need to figure out how to get happening in a much more robust way in the Midwest. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But to simplify, railroads are pretty versatile. They're like Legos where you can take different Lego blocks and put them together and build different kinds of houses and different kinds of things, right? And it comes as a kit. And ideally you might build it as that kit and then you take it all apart and you do it different ways. Railroads are like that. So say you've got a right of way that's out there. Maybe you can move all the freight trains someplace else and make that a passenger dedicated main. Maybe you need to build a new railroad. Maybe it's okay to work with the freight railroad to figure out how to run a train every two hours at no faster than 80 miles an hour, right? We don't know, but we know that these pieces can, can come together in different ways depending upon your needs and your assets. Uh, but to simplify the discussion, I've narrowed it down, and this is very similar. So in the Midwest Regional Rail Plan, they talk about Core Express Regional and Emerging. They're talking about service levels in that. In this, I'm talking about infrastructure, right? So you've got shared use lines, which um, I really think we can't, we have to stop talking about 110 miles an hour on shared use lines, keep it at 80 or 90 miles an hour because then you're not causing lots of conflicts, get the frequencies up at that speed and figure out how to not go slow. Um, but there are lots of cases of shared use lines working around the country. Uh, the line to Elburn has 80, 90 trains a day on it that run on time. Uh, the line to Aurora has, I don't know now, but pre-COVID it was almost 100 trains a day that run on time. You can make shared use work if you build the infrastructure right, if you have the right relationship between the passenger railroad and the owner of the track and whoever's dispatching that track. Uh, but it takes investment. Right, Just like we build highways, we need to have the states uh, investing heavily in freight tracks. Um, at the other end, high-speed lines where you are building completely new track, no grade crossings, electrification, going 220 miles an hour. This is where the thing really changes the dynamic of whether people will choose to drive or not. And then the middle is regional, where you're taking an existing asset and focusing it on passenger trains. Um, and so the Northeast Corridor is one example of a regional line in this country where there's still freight trains running on it. There's a lot of mix of stuff, but we've got high speed trains running on the Northeast Corridor. So because you have to have a different kind of train to go fast than you do to run on freight tracks where the track is really rough, um, you've got a challenge where the high speed trains can probably go on regional 
and um, high speed lines and then the freight trains and everything else can go on both there's that kind of this overlap um, but unfortunately you can't just have a high speed train go everywhere which would make a life a lot easier if you could so just as a quick aside the best study i've seen and this is not a study formally that a government entity paid for but this is the best assessment i've seen of where this country should be building new high-speed lines um it's pretty close i think in the fra actually did a midwest plan and a southeast plan um and i think if they were to, and they they actually have in the fra plan um minneapolis to miami new high-speed line, right? Now, again, we don't know how we're gonna get there. It's kind of, it's not really a plan, it's a framework, but we're starting to see where it makes sense. I think if they did a national plan, um, you would end up with something like this. But I wanted to point out, you guys have one here that could be the trunk line of something great. And unfortunately, there hasn't been any real planning work done on it since the 80s slash 90s, uh, but it's there if, we could get the momentum going to get it started. Um, and then, so this is the FRA plan. It's more of a framework. Um, and you can see again that they are saying that it certainly, that it justifies having a new high-speed line um, between Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, and, and St. Paul. Uh, where those tracks go, we don't know. I imagine it takes some sort of regional line from Milwaukee and Madison, probably both into Chicago. But again, this is something that's an opportunity out there if we can start thinking bigger. When we talk about high-speed rail, we have to talk about foreign countries. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about California, which is pretty much as foreign as you can get. Right? So in 1990, a coalition was put together the bill passed in 1990, which invested a very large amount of money in their shared use network. So they built commuter rail networks from scratch that didn't exist before. They took the one or two Amtrak trains a day that were running and they ramped them up, right? So they've been working on this now for 30 years. Um, and they've got the kind of network that I wish we had in the Midwest. So this is my son some years ago, um, getting on the surf liner, um, uh, in Oceanside, where there's a connection to buses and a local train and other things. Um, so they are much farther ahead than us. And so there are lots of lessons, both good and bad, that we can learn from them. One of the lessons is what to do with shared use. So this is their shared use network, uh, both the commuter rail and the Amtrak services all in one place in blue. Kind of the orangish is the Amtrak single, the national trains that go once a day. And then the yellow is connecting buses. So today it's slow and sometimes doesn't quite work for the, but you can get anywhere in the state by a combination of bus or train. For the, when I say anywhere, most of the major cities. Um, and so all of these buses are coordinated with the trains so that you have one ticket to go from one side of the state to the other. Um, and this is very well coordinated. Uh, what they ended up doing was splitting their Amtrak contracts into three so that you've got the Central Valley is worried about its Amtrak and commuter rail services. You've got low sand down in the southwest and then uh, Capital Corridor across the top. So this is what we should be working for very quickly in the Midwest. We've got a challenge. This is one state. We need to make Wisconsin work. We need at least three states and probably Michigan, right? Um, so it's a little bit bigger challenge. One of the reasons we're so far behind, but this is where we need to get to. And I wanna point out this line down the middle, I drove one day from Sacramento, I actually split it up, Sacramento to LA. And I was amazed how much it looked like the Midwest, except it was dry and there were mountain ranges and there was Chinese quality air. Um, but in terms of the way the cities are developed, it's like the Midwest. Um, and so I wanna point out on a single track shared use line, they have a train today and they've scheduled them every two hours and they know where they're going to add those next two hours. Uh, Pre-COVID, they were about to go to nine. 
um, and then they've scaled it back. But again, we have to start thinking about frequency and making this work um, in terms of being having different choices to go. And I want to also point out there's an early morning 4 a.m. train. Um, so we've got to think broader than just one or two trains a day. And it's very, very doable if the state invests the money that it needs to do. So something along the lines of a little bit more than what you pay to mow grass on the highways. Also in 1990, they started designing high-speed rail. The legislature hasn't been fully committed to it, um, so they delayed the process by a couple of years, but they did this past year recommit to building high-speed rail. Um, and so if you come back to this network, you'll see there's a missing gap in the shared use network here, and there's also one between Merced, Fresno, and San Jose. Those are really important links in the system that don't exist today. Um, they're also the hardest part to do. Um, so they will fill those gaps in with high-speed rail. So you need new tunnels through there to make passenger rail, rail work. The only way to justify building those tunnels is to build high-speed rail. Um, and But you can't do those tunnels without having a demonstration case. So they're building the new high-speed line from Bakersfield up to Merced. Um, and that is under construction today. And again, the legislature recommitted to building that last spring. Um, they also have environmental approval for everything else almost, except for the Antelope Valley. And the really interesting thing was there was a guy named Anthony Murnell who owned a big casino in Las Vegas, and he was concerned about the future of his business. So he actually, out of his own pocket, designed a high-speed line from uh, Las Vegas to Victorville. And because he knows where his customers live, he did know that Victorville was a good place to start the train, right? Because you don't have to get up over the Cajon Pass. And he knows where everybody's driving to. Uh, but he's ended up, he couldn't get that quite to work, so he sold it to Brightline. Brightline is almost completed with the environmental work Another to get Another way to, to relieve traffic on I-15, promoting more travel by train? Yep, last month the company Brightline signed paperwork with the state of California to expand the high-speed rail line from Rancho Cucamonga to Victorville and on to Las Vegas. Brightline says the trip would take around two hours. Yesterday, Governor Newsom mentioned that it's a private venture and the pandemic has caused even more delays than here's what Governor Sisolak had to say. I got here in 1976 and they were talking about a high speed of rail between California and Nevada. And they're still talking about it, but we're making progress now. Yes, both governors said progress is being made. No word yet on an expected completion date. We've heard over the years just dozens of programs to, you know, construct a high speed train. Between so here this and there. is really exciting progress. The problem that they made, there's a couple. One was they didn't really think the engineers weren't responsible for implementing. So they didn't really think about what the best way to put the infrastructure or the right of way in was. Um, and so you had some challenges with the right of way issue. So the one thing, if we're gonna do this, you really have to focus on right of way, whether it's shared use or high speed. Um, and then the other that they did was they ran high speed rail as a parallel separate entity to the rest of the program. But finally, in 2018, they brought that all together. So what they did, and this is the only time this has done, been done in this country, they took, this is the network. So they have took a whole, the whole state and they planned for 2040 what the train schedule is going to be so that they could work backwards and say, how do we phase this in? Um, and you can see that high-speed line there. In this case, red is not high-speed line, it's high-speed trains. And there are some cases where they're operating on regional lines. Uh, but that high-speed line down the middle of the state is what makes the whole program work. Um, so it's really exciting. They're doing a revision of this. It's gonna be released this year. And this is what we really need to get to on a national basis, knowing where each of this piece and how it fits together so that we can get there. And we've done it for the highway network twice. After World War I, the feds funded a federal highway program, and then in 1956 again. And by the way, we increased gas taxes by the, roughly the rate of 60 cents in today's money in 56 to do that. Um, so this is the part that really excites me. Here you've got 
uh, rail ridership today, county to county. So roughly it's Southern counties to Northern counties. And Fresno here on this, the, the lines are so small that you don't see the Fresno line. So for the Midwest, Fresno is a really busy Amtrak station, but it doesn't show up on this map, right? And the reason not is if they only do, this was the 2018 plan and their plans have changed a little bit, but if they only did in a disconnected way, what was planned in 2017, this is what you would get. And now you see the Northern and the rural counties up there are starting to be a lot more feeder bus service. But if you coordinate things, make sure there's a unified ticket, make sure that when the bus comes into the station, the train is waiting there so that you can get on the train and go, you basically start connecting the whole state. And up there at the top are some really rural counties that start to see real bus ridership because that whole system has improved in order to make everything work much better. And that's why we've got to start figuring out, even though we've got the challenge of multiple states, how to start doing these regional rail plans um, in the national level, the state level, regional level in the mix, and then local level for transit. So what might this look like for Wisconsin? Um, so we've got here, and I apologize, we're playing with colors and this contrast doesn't work. But um, in the dark blue, you've got where shared use trains are running today. In the thicker kind of dark blue or medium sized blue, you've got um, what's in the state rail plan. And then the dotted lines are things that you look at the map and go, why isn't this on the map? So I talked about right of way and the biggest challenge in all of this is right of way. And the hardest part right now is between a place called Roundout and um, Techni in Northern Illinois. So what do we do about adding track capacity between Chicago and Milwaukee? Well, there's a line with no freight on it along the lakefront. So maybe after you do the 10 trains a day, you start adding trains here. There's also a line with no freight on it to speak of up to Madison. Well, let's start thinking bigger about how do we get places like Crock County and or Racine or such. Let's talk about a lot more bus service across the whole state and actually have the state fund a statewide bus system, not on piecemeal. It's, you know, you've got a decent route network today, and it's amazing how much of that you can buy on the Amtrak. You can, like, you can buy an Amtrak ticket from Madison to Nice. Um, which I find really exciting, but it's only one bus a day. Well, let's get that to four or five. Um, start working out how this all works together and start phasing it together. This is where we need to start heading. The challenge is we've got to make progress today. Um, so while we're both talking about this vision, getting people thinking about this vision, we also need to make immediate progress. and We need to think and run at the same time. Um, I'm not sure that's the right phrase, but I, I hopefully you got your point. The other thing that happens with this statewide plan, up there, they need bigger connections or better connections. And right now, if the framing is Madison to Milwaukee, why should the state invest in that? That's one part of the state. If you're talking about a statewide vision where the entire state is much better connected together as a single state, then I think it becomes much easier to talk about a real program. Um, and if we're going to have good passenger trains in Wisconsin, the state is going to have to invest money. It's going to take a lot of time. We've basically got two years to build a strong coalition statewide um, in order to start getting the state to invest real money in, in this program. Um, so that's, that's kind of the vision where we could go if we don't have to, but it's my idea of where we should go. Um, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to ask them. Well, I'll ask, ask mine here. So, so Rick, I think if you talk to the average person in Wisconsin, the high-speed rail program in California is just a big boondoggle and a waste of money. What is your response to that? It is easier to be against something. Um, when you're the first, it's easy to make mistakes. Um, and it's interesting, the real delays have been 
the democratic legislature not taking the steps they need to move it forward. So um, the opponents can talk about, you know, they actually, it's frustrating because they talk about the wrong things. So if you saw, there was a New York Times article six months ago, which had the completely wrong story. But so we can't learn from the things that they really did if we are focused on the, on the errors in the New York Times article. But here's when people fight about things. And when people start calling things boondoggles is when it's important. You don't fight about, you don't complain things about things that aren't important. High speed rail in California is important and they've decided to move it forward and they're going to move it forward. Right, so Jackie's question for the Zoom audience, really two things. One was you noticed um, well, what is the role of Eau Claire maybe as sort of, there, there's other lines through Eau Claire on your map, such as going to Northern Wisconsin. So a comment on that. Uh, and then the, Midwest Regional Rail Initiative was a number of states working together. How do the states work together to actually implement a plan like you're talking about? Um, so there were nine states involved. Unfortunately, a couple had dropped out. Um, somebody did a real number on, on rail advocates in 2010. Um, they, they were very effective in their campaign, whoever it was. Um, and uh, if if you look at how well it fit, I am convinced there was somebody who was behind that in some big way. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, some states did drop out. Uh, we need to get them back. Um, and I think we're, we're in a position where, you know, um, when I left Chicago on Wednesday, it was spring weather in January. Um, I think that issue is getting harder to ignore. Um, so we do have some work. There are lots of people who want trains. Um, we can make it work. Uh, if, if we keep working on small steps and big vision at the same time, we, we definitely can do it and we can get some of the other states involved. Wisconsin's a huge opportunity. I'm excited about how Wisconsin can lead the other states to do something. Um, and there was another piece of that. Important. So Eau Claire has a couple of roles to play in, in a number of uh, very important ways. One is that right-of-way issue. And so, um, you know, where do you put more tracks to run much more frequent service is a challenge. Um, and so Eau Claire is sitting on that. If you look, there's just this funnel here, right? If you come up this way, you just got Portage to Camp Douglas where you're kind of you've got a funnel of where you've got a really busy freight line. So that's, so that's one opportunity. The other is that is the jumping off point going the east to the east from you. Um, I want to point out that I went to a conference in Escanaba uh, last summer, and I was surprised at the air service uh, to get to Escanaba. And we did some research into how much the feds were paying to run airplanes there and how bad the service was uh, for that cost. And um, you've got a problem again, that's Michigan now. So you're bringing in other states. So what do you do about that? But we've really got to figure out how to get the UP involved as well, which then again, ties this whole thing together in a very different way. I think <laughs> the question is, have, has the High-Speed Rail Alliance done any work on return on investment for these investments. Um, and uh, we did do that for a base high-speed rail network in 2011, 2012. Um, and that's downloadable from our website. We haven't done it for any of the other things. Would love to, a uh, little bit beyond our scope. The things that we can do at this time um, are, we can provide a much more optimistic voice for the media. So if, if if you can't talk to the media, but somebody needs to, we can do that. Um, we can keep uh, folks like you engaged in what's happening um, and we can support the businesses who want to do it. I would love to do some more of that return on investment work. Um, and if you know somebody who's willing to make a donation to do it, yeah. happy to do it. We appreciate Rick's uh, positive comments about Eau Claire and the development. And uh, we've looked at, uh, we, we are sort of presuming the station will be downtown, but one of the, the things that will come out of all the studies and et cetera going forward is just where to put it. Um, and if you really think train stuff's exciting, 
or you really like to get into government policy, we're going to be doing a zoning code rewrite in Eau Claire in the next year and a half. And it sounds...